In this lecture, we shall look at a new topic, namely arrays in Haskell. Arrays are generally used to make programs more efficient. We will illustrate this with the following example. Consider the function fib which computes the nth Fibonacci number f of n. Fib 0 equals 1, fib of 1 equals 1, fib of n equals fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2. You can see that this program is a straightforward translation of the mathematical definition of the Fibonacci series. The program is quite simple, but the problem with it is that there are lots of recursive calls, computing the same value over and over again. For instance, fib of 3 makes two calls, one to fib of 2 and another to fib of 1. Fib of 2 in turn makes a recursive call to fib of 1 and fib of 0. So you see that already fib1 is being called twice. If you consider a call like fib of 5, then you can imagine that there are more calls to fib1, which in effect recomputes the same value again and again. In fact, one can see that this program computes f of n in unary in effect. To make this formal, let g of n be the number of recursive calls to fib0 in the computation of fib of n for n greater than 1. It's easy to see that g of 2 equals 1 because fib of 2 equals fib of 1 plus fib of 0. So there is one recursive call to fib0. It's also easy to see that g of 3 equals 1 because fib of 3 equals fib of 2 plus fib of 1. Fib of 2 makes a recursive call to fib1 and another recursive call to fib0. Fib1 is defined directly. So there is one recursive call to fib0. We claim that g of n equals f of n minus 2. For a proof, we see that the statement is true for n equals 2 and n equals 3. For n greater than 3, g of n equals g of n plus n minus 1 plus g of n minus 2. Because there is one call to fib of n minus 1 and one call to fib of n minus 2 in fib of n. And uh, there are g of n minus 1 calls to fib 0 in fib n minus 1 and g of n minus 2 calls to fib 0 in fib of n minus 2. But by induction hypothesis, we know that g of n minus 1 equals f of n minus 3 and g of n minus 2 equals f of n minus 4. Therefore, g of n equals f of n minus 3 plus f of n minus 4, which is f of n minus 2, which is a large number which grows exponentially in the size of n. Thus, we see that there are exponentially many calls to fib of 0 in a computation of fib of n. How do we fix this situation? One easy way to do this in other languages is to just store the computed values in an array and use the values from the array rather than recomputing them again and again. In a language like C, for instance, we would have the following code. We have an array fibs which store all the Fibonacci numbers from uh, f0 to fn minus 1. You initialize the array by saying fibs of 0 equals fibs of 1 equals 1. Then you fill in the entries in the array from index 2 till index n minus 1. So initialize you initialize i equals 2 while i is less than n, you just compute fibs of i to be equal to fibs of i minus 1 plus fibs of i minus 2. This computation does not involve, involve a recursive call, rather it just picks up two values from the array, adds them and stores it in the new value of the array. Finally, you return fibs of n, which is the nth entry in the array. This program actually takes time proportional to n rather than proportional to 2 to the n as in the earlier case. We can simplify this program even more by observing that only the last two elements of the FIBS array are ever needed. So you can have two variables previous and current storing the last two values of the FIBS array then you run a loop from for i equals 2 to n 
where you move the current value to the previous to the value previous and uh, you move the sum of the two variables to current in this way you just keep track of the last two entries of the fibs array and finally you return the value of the current variable we can also program a linear time fibonacci function in haskell by using the power of laziness here is the function fast fib n which just builds the fibonacci series in a list and extracts the nth entry fibs is a function with signature list of integer and it's given by this program fibs equals 1 colon 1 colon zip width of plus fibs and tail of fibs the way the computation unfolds is as follows this is the expression 1 colon 1 colon zip width of plus fibs and tail of fibs but fibs we know now is 1 comma 1 comma some other entries tail of fibs is 1 comma some other entries so now zip width will add this one with this one and do a zip width of plus and the tail of the two lists so it will be the tail of this list but we now know that the second entry in this list is 2 because that has been computed so you will have 1 colon 1 colon 2 colon zip width using plus of 1 comma 2 comma dot 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 and the tail of this list which is 2 comma dot 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 this in turn will give rise to 1 colon 1 colon 2 colon 3 colon zip width of plus on the two lists 2 comma 3 comma dot 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 and its tail which is 3 comma dot 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 and so on you see that you finally end up with the list 1 colon 1 colon 2 colon 3 colon 5 colon etc which is an infinite list that contains all the fibonacci numbers extracting the nth element gives you the nth fibonacci number that was fine but now let's consider another example this is the example of computing the longest common subsequence of two strings string 1 and string 2 we in fact want to just compute the length of the longest common subsequence of string 1 and string 2 for instance lcss agcat and gact equals 3 because gat is a subsequence of agcat and gat is also a subsequence of gact that is the longest common subsequence lcss of abracadabra and bakarat equals 6 because bakara is a common subsequence and that is the longest subsequence b a c a r a here also you see b a c a r a how do you program this well lcss of the empty string with anything is zero because the empty string doesn't have any subsequence or you could say the empty string has only itself as a subsequence and the empty string is always the subsequence of any other sequence lcss of anything else and the empty string is also zero lcss of two non empty strings which are given by c colon c's and d colon d's is computed as follows in the case that c is equal to d then you know that any subsequence any common subsequence of c's and d's can be extended by adding c to the front and that will give you a subsequence of length one longer so if you have something to be the longest common subsequence of c's and d's which is computed by lcss c's d's you can always add one to it you can always add one letter to the front namely c and get a common subsequence whose length is one longer than the length of lcss c's and d's otherwise this is the case when c is not equal to d then it is clear that the first letter is not the same so therefore the longest common subsequence of c colon c's and d colon d's is either the longest common subsequence of c colon c's with d's or the longest common subsequence of c's 
with d colon d's which is exactly what we are doing here in the case that c is not equal to d we the longest common subsequence the length of the longest common subsequence of these two lists is the same as max of lcss c colon c's and d's and lcss c's and d colon d's one can prove that lcss of c's and d's which are two strings takes time at least 2 to the n where c's and d's are of length n there is a similar problem to fib in that the same recursive call is made multiple times with the same arguments so the easiest way out is to store the computed values for efficiency store the values computed and extract the values later rather than recomputing them here is another example which is that of linear time sort we already know that programs like merge sort take order n log n time and one can even prove a lower bound for sorting that to sort a list to sort an array of length n you need n log n time but these are for algorithms which are based on comparison in linear time sort we will follow a different idea under a crucial assumption we are given a list of n integers such that each integer is between 0 and 9999 say so each of the integers lie between a pre specified range and now we want to sort this list suppose the list were stored in arrays what we could do is to count the number of occurrences of each number between 0 and 9999 in this list and store it in a different array which stores all the counts and now we just need to output count j copies of j where j ranges from 0 to 9999 that will actually produce the sorted array here is the program that realizes it you have an array counts which uh, holds 10000 entries entries ranging from counts 0 to counts 9999 you have an input array which is of size n you have an output array which is of size n you first fill in the counts array with the appropriate you first initialize the counts array to 0 and then you walk through the input array for i equals 0 till n minus 1 you look at each array entry and then update the appropriate counts entry so if array i equals 500 let's say counts of 500 will be incremented by 1 now the final part is just to go through the counts array and output so many copies of j for j ranging from 0 to 9999 you look at counts j and output so many copies of j this will give you the sorted version of the original array this algorithm works in time n plus 10000 so if n is much larger than 10000 you have actually managed to sort an array of size n in linear time to achieve all this in haskell we need to actually use arrays we know that lists store a collection of elements the crucial point about lists is that accessing the ith element takes i steps it would be useful to access any element in constant time and this feature is offered by arrays in haskell to use arrays you need to import the module data.array here is how you use this import data.array and then uh, you want to declare an array you want to declare an array let's say my array the type of an array is given like this for instance my array is of type array int car here the indices of the array come from int and the values stored in the array come from come from car the, for instance if you say that my array equals list array 
0 to a b the list a b c then it produces this array this is an array with three indices 0 1 and 2 and the values a at index 0 b at index 1 and c at index 2 this notation says that we have to create an array from the given list with indices lying between 0 and 2. We look at list array in more detail now. List array has type ixi implies the pair i comma i arrow list e arrow array ie. ix is the type class of all index types which are those types that can be used as indices in arrays. If ix a holds and x and y are of type a and x is less than y then the range of values between x and y is defined and finite. This is the property of the type class ix. For instance, ix includes the types int, car, par int, comma int, the triple int, comma int, comma car, etc. but not float or list int. Because if you take two floating point values x and y and let us say x is less than y, then the range of values between x and y is not finite. Similarly, if you take the list, let us say the list consisting of the single element 1 and the list consisting of the single element 2, there are infinitely many lists that lie in between these two. The list consisting of 1 comma 2, the list 1 comma 1 comma 2, the list 1 comma 1 comma 1 comma 2, etc. all lie in between the singleton list 1 and the singleton list 2. Therefore, list int cannot be used as an index type. The first argument of the list array function specifies the smallest and largest index of the array i comma i. The second argument is the list of values to be stored in the array. And finally, the output is an array whose index type is i and whose value type is e. For example, list array applied to the pair 1 comma 1 and the list 100 dot dot 199 will give you the following array. Array 1 comma 1 which is the range of the indices. The indices range from 1 to 1 which means that there is only one index and the list itself, the array itself consists of one entry with index 1 and value 100. The values in the arrays are filled in the order they are presented in the list. So therefore, 100 is associated with the index 1 and not say 129. Here is another example. List array, the pair m comma p where m and p are the characters and where you want to store values from 0 comma 2 dot dot which is the infinite list of all the even positive integers will give you the following array array with index bounds m and p and the entries of the array there are four entries in the array the index m stores the value 0 index n stores the value 2 index 0 stores the value 4 index p stores the value 6. Here is another example list array b comma a and values from 1 dot dot which is the infinite list will give you the empty array. This is because a the character a is actually less than the character b. So therefore there cannot be any index. Uh, a prerequisite for an array to have at least one entry is that the upper bound of the index should be actually greater than or equal to the lower bound of the index. Here is another example list array 0, 4, 100 dot dot. This will be array with bounds for the index as 0 and 4 and entries being 0, 100, 1, 101, 2, 102, 3, 103 and 4, 104. Here is another example list array 1, 3 
which tells that there are three indices 1, 2 and 3 and the list itself has only two elements a, b. This will actually produce an exception because Haskell tries to fill a value corresponding to index 3 but it cannot find any element. So it gives an exception saying undefined array element. The value at index i of an array is accessed using the single exclamation mark. Like so, array exclamation mark i. Unlike the double exclamation mark for list access. So, arr exclamation i returns the ith value in the array, but it returns an exception if no value has been defined for index i. Which is why in the earlier slide, you saw that uh, we got an exception for creating an array with three index values but with only two values. Suppose we created an array, my array, using list array 1 comma 3 a comma b comma c. Now if we try to access the fourth element in the array, my array exclamation mark 4, we will again get an exception saying that index 4 is out of range. An important point to note is that Haskell arrays are lazy. The whole array need not be defined before some elements are accessed. For example, we can fill in locations 0 and 1 of the array and define the ith element of the array in terms of the i minus first element and the i minus second element. This is exactly reminiscent of the array version of the computing the Fibonacci series in C. Another point to note is that list array takes time proportional to the range of the indices. So if there are k indices, the a call to list array takes time order k. There is another way to create arrays which is to use the call array, which is to use the function array whose type is as follows, ixi implies the pair i, i arrow list of pairs i, e arrow array ie. So instead of producing a list of only values which was a list of elements of type e, we are now providing an associative list and creating an array out of this. The associative list need not be in ascending order of the indices. For instance, you could create an array as follows, my array equals array the pair 0, 2 and then the entries are 1 comma the string o n e, 0 comma the string z e r o, 2 comma the string t w o. But notice that the elements of the associative list are presented in not presented in ascending order of the indices. The associative list may also omit elements. So you have array 0 comma 2, 0 a b c comma 2 x y z. There is no entry for 1. This call also takes time proportional to the range of the indices. Let's look at indices in a little more detail. Any type A belonging to the type class ix must provide the following functions. A range, which is a function from pairs of the form a, a to list a. Index, which is a function from which is a function with signature pair a, a arrow a arrow int. In range which has signature pair a comma a arrow a arrow bool and range size which has signature pair a comma a arrow int. The range function gives the list of indices in the subrange defined by the bounding pair. The first a is the lower bound and the second a is the upper bound and this list a gives all the elements that lie between the first number the first element here and the second element given here. For instance, range of 1 comma 2 is the list 1 comma 2. Range of character m comma character p is the string m n o p. Range of character z comma character a is the empty string because a is smaller than z. Index gives the position of a subscript in the subrange. For instance, index of minus 50 
in the sub range defined by minus 50 comma 60 is 0 index of 35 in the sub range defined by minus 50 and 60 is 85 because you go from 50 to 0 and then from 1 to 35 index of o the character o in the range defined by the character m and the character p is 2 because you go m is 0 n is 1 and o is 2 index of a the character a in the range defined by m comma p will give an exception because a is out of the range m comma p in range is a function that checks whether a given element lies in the range or not for instance in range of minus 50 comma 60 applied on minus 50 will be true uh, you can also check that o is inside the range defined by m and p but a is not inside the range defined by m and p so in range returns false range size just gives you the size of the range defined by the lower bound and upper bound for instance range size applied to minus 50 comma 60 will give you 111 range size applied to the character m comma the character p will give you 4 range size defined by 50 comma 0 will give you 0 because 0 is strictly less than 50 here are some more functions on arrays the exclamation mark which we mentioned earlier is to access an array entry it has signature ixi implies array ie arrow i arrow e so it gives the value at the given index in an array bounds is a function that takes array ie as an argument and returns the lower and upper bounds of the indices the bounds with which the array was originally constructed indices is a function that lists the indices of an array in ascending order rather than providing just a pair it produces the list of all indices elims is a function that produces the list of all elements of an array in index order asox is a function that lists all associations of an array in order of end, in the ascending order of index its signature is ixi implies array ie arrow list of pairs i comma e let's now get back to our original example that of computing fibonacci numbers but now using arrays fib is a function with signature int arrow integer fib of n equals fib a exclamation mark n which is accessing the nth element of the array fib a fib a is array int integer the indices are from int and the values are from integer and now we use the fact that haskell arrays are lazy fib a is defined to be list array 0 comma n where the ith entry is given by the function f f i you create an array out of the list consisting of all values f i f i for i ranging from 0 to n f i f is defined as follows f of 0 is 1 f of 1 is 1 f of i is not f of i minus 1 plus f of i minus 2 as we would have done in a recursive program but fib a exclamation mark i minus 1 plus fib a exclamation mark i minus 2 we are just referring to the array and picking the elements from the array the i minus first element and the i minus second element in case the value at fib a has not been defined yet haskell will lazily make a call to f i minus 1 but the first time it will make a call to f it will fill the entry in the array but the second time a call to fib f i minus 1 is made it will just pick out the entry from the array the fib array is used even before it is completely defined thanks to haskell's laziness and this program works in order n time because all it needs is to just fill n entries by referring to previous entries in the array Here is how we can compute LCSs using arrays. We restate the we first restate the recursive LCSs in terms of indices. LCSs 
is a function with signature string arrow string arrow int but we will work with a version lcss prime which works as int arrow int arrow int lcss string 1 string 2 equals lcss prime 0 0 where lcss prime computes the length of the longest common subsequence of drop i string 1 drop j string 2 and uh, since drop 0 of string 1 is equal to string 1 and drop 0 of string 2 is equal to string 2 computing lcss prime of 0 comma 0 achieves what we want to achieve which is to compute lcss of string 1 and string 2 let m be the length of string 1 minus 1 and n be the length of string 1 minus 1 length of string 2 minus 1 these are the last indices if you will of string 1 and string 2 now lcss prime of ij is defined as follows is defined as follows if i is greater than m or j is greater than n the value is 0 otherwise if string if the character at the ith location of string 1 is the same as the character at the jth location of string 2 the result is 1 plus lcss prime of i plus 1 j plus 1 if the ith character of string 1 is not equal to the jth character of string 2 then as earlier we compute the result using max of lcss prime of i and j plus 1 and lcss prime of i plus 1 and j now we have restated the original lcss function in terms of recursion on indices this we will try to transcribe directly into an array based program here is lcss using arrays lcss of string 1 string 2 is the 0th entry of the array lcss a the array lcss a is a two dimensional array whose indices range from 0 comma 0 to m comma n the entry of the array at i comma j is supposed to be the longest common subsequence of string 1 starting from index i and string 2 starting from index j or in other words drop i of string 1 and drop j of string 2. In creating lcss a we use the array function rather than the list array function because it is easier to provide the values of the array in terms of an associative list. So we define lcss a as array with range 0, 0 to m, n and entries of the form the pair i, j, the value f applied to i and j. So this is the index and this is the value and the index and value is given as a pair where i ranges from 0 to m and j ranges from 0 to n. In a two dimensional array of this form the indices are ordered as follows 0, 0 followed by 0, 1 followed by 0, 2 all the way to 0, n then comes 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2 etc all the way to 1, n then 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2 etc. Now f is defined as follows f on i and j is very similar to the index based recursive function that was uh, described earlier if i is greater than or equal to m or if j is greater than or equal to n the value is 0 otherwise check if the ith element of string 1 is the same as the jth element of string 2 in that case the result is 1 plus lcss a exclamation mark i plus 1 comma j plus 1 notice here that instead of making a recursive call to f we just refer to the corresponding element in the array at the appropriate index otherwise if string 1 exclamation exclamation i is not equal to the jth element of string 2 we define f of ij to be max of lcss a exclamation mark i comma j plus 1 lcss a exclamation mark i plus 1 comma j 
this is the function one minor drawback here is that we repeatedly use exclamation exclamation in accessing string 1 and string 2 here recall that we said that accessing an element of an array can be done in constant time whereas accessing the ith element of a list takes time order of order i the solution would be to turn the strings themselves into arrays which is done as follows here is the version which works on arrays rather than strings lcss of string 1 string 2 is lcss a exclamation 0 comma 0 where instead of using string 1 and string 2 in the description of f here we use ar1 and ar2 which are two arrays ar1 is got by list array 0 comma m string 1 where m is the length of string 1 ar2 is list array 0 comma n string 2 where n is the length of string 2 lcss a itself is defined defined as usual array with indices ranging from 0 comma 0 to m comma n and entries of the form i comma j comma f applied to i and j where i ranges from 0 to m and j ranges from 0 to n f is now defined in terms of ar1 and ar2 f of ij equals 0 if i is greater than m or j is greater than n otherwise if ar1 at position i is equal to ar2 at position j then you define it to be 1 plus lcss a at position i plus 1 comma j plus 1 otherwise you define it as usual the difference here is that we access the array rather than the string repeatedly this program one can check runs in time order mn because all we need to do is fill in elements in the array and the number of elements in the array the number of indices of this array is m plus 1 times n plus 1 so the program runs in time order m which is a vast improvement over 2 to the n that we had earlier let's look at the computation in a little more detail let's look at the call tree for the case when m equals n equals 3 the call tree for L lcss so the first call to f i j so we are considering f of 3 3 the first call to f of ij stores the value in the array and subsequent calls with the same values of i and j return the value from the array rather than making the recursive call and this technique is called memoization it's an important technique in algorithm design where you translate a recursive algorithm to a more efficient version by just storing the values and referring to them later so initially there is a call made to f of 0 comma 0 this spawns calls to f of 0 comma 1 not f of 1 comma 0 possibly it will all it might also spawn a call to f of 1 comma 1 but that occurs here anyway f of 0 comma 1 might spawn calls to f of 0 comma 2 and 1 comma 1 0 comma 2 spawns calls to 0 comma 3 1 comma 2 this in turn leads to calls on 0 comma 3 terminates because 3 if you recall is greater than or equal to m uh, 3 is greater than or equal to n which is 3 therefore this call terminates by giving the value 0 and that will be stored in the array 1 comma 2 gives rise to calls to 1 comma 3 and 2 comma 2 2 comma 2 makes calls to 2 comma 3 and 3 comma 2 these two calls terminate because here 3 is greater than n and here 3 is greater than m now once this returns we will have to process calls to 1 comma 1 1 comma 1 gives rise to calls to 1 comma 2 and 2 comma 1 but 1 comma 2 here is a repeat call so the values are picked up from the array rather than reading leading to a recursive call so there won't be any this whole tree under 1 comma 2 will not be repeated 1 comma 1 also gives rise to a call to 2 comma 1 which in turn gives rise to calls to 2 comma 2 and 3 comma 1 but 2 comma 2 is a repeat call it occurs earlier here already so its value is picked up from the array and this tree is not repeated underneath 3 comma 1 terminates because 3 is greater than or equal to m and so on you see that there are two more repeat calls here so in this manner 
we see that we never have to spend time more than order m n. And this example also illustrates how exactly lazy arrays work. Here is another way to create an array which is to use the function called accume array. Accume array accumulates values into array positions and it works as follows. Its signature is ixi implies e arrow e arrow e which is an accumulating function. This is similar to the kinds of functions you would provide as arguments to fold r or fold l. In particular, this is the kind of function that you would provide as an argument to fold l. e which is an initial entry that will be placed in placed at each index of the array. i comma i this provides the bounds of the array and an association list which is a list of pairs i comma i. With all this it produces an array array ie. Let's look at how it works. Accume array with function plus and initial value 0 with indices ranging from the character A to the character D and with the elements coming from the associative list given here A comma 2, B comma 3, A comma 2, C comma 4 produces the following array. An array with indices ranging from A to D and entries A comma 4, B comma 3, C comma 4 and D comma 0. How do you explain the entries? Well, 4 is 2 plus 2. 3 is just 3, the 4 here is just 4 and the 0 here is the initial value that was placed at the index D. So you see that Accume array does the following, it places the initial value at all entries and then whenever it encounters a particular index, it adds the corresponding value, it adds the value that is encountered to the corresponding entry in the array. In this case it adds because the function that was provided was plus. If it was star, it would have multiplied. So you see that using this function, you accumulate all the values associated with this particular index in the list into the array at the appropriate index. To look at another example, accume array with function plus and initial value 0 and uh, with bounds 1 comma 3 and uh, the list provided by 1 comma 1, 2 comma 1 etc produces the following array, array with bounds 1 comma 3 and uh, entries being 1 comma 2, 2 comma 3 and 3 comma 1. Here we are just counting the number of repetitions of each element. One occurs twice here and here and uh, we keep track of the count by initializing the value 0 at array entry 1 and then using the function plus to add 1 every time we encounter 1. Similarly, whenever we encounter 2, we add 1 to the accumulator. Since three, 2 occurs thrice, here, here and here, the final value associated to index 2 in the array is 3. 3 occurs once, so the finally you will have 1 as the value at index 3. Accume array f e l comma u list. f is the function, e is the initial entry, l comma u is the lower bound in, on the indices and upper bound on the indices and list is the association list. Creates an array with indices l dot dot u in time proportional to u minus l which is important provided f can be computed in constant time. For a particular i between l and u, if i comma a1, i comma a2 etc i comma a n are all the elements with index i appearing in this list, the value for i in the array is f applied to e and a1, the result applied, f applied to the result and a2, f applied to that result and a3 etc and finally f applied to that result and a n. So it is a fold l version applied with all the values corresponding to i that occurs in the association list. 
So the entry at index i this accumulates using the function f all the ai values that are associated with i in the list. We can use this to sort in linear time as follows. Suppose we are given the list 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 5, 7, 8, 1, 3, 1. We first create another list, an association list as follows by zipping it with one repeated infinitely often. That will produce a list of pairs where the first element of each pair is from the original list and the second element is always one. How do you produce this list 1, 1, 1, 1, 1? Recall that iterate is a function which behaves as follows. Iterate fx equals the list x, comma f of x, comma f of f of x, comma f of f of f of x, etc. So you can start with x being 1 and f being the identity function and you will get you will see that iterate id 1 equals the infinite list consisting only of 1s. From this association list, you produce an array, array 1, 8. The 1 here is the minimum value in the original list and 8 is the maximum value in the original list. So these are the bounds of your array. And uh, you produce this array using accum array. Therefore, this array stores the count of the number of repetitions of each entry. From this array, you go to the list 1, 3, 2, 2, 3, 2, etc. You can obtain this list from the array by using the function asox. Once you have this list, you replicate one thrice and that is done using the function replicate. Replicate ni give, gives you the list consisting of the value i repeated n times. So replicate 3, 1 gives you the list 1, 1, 1. Then you replicate 2 twice, replicate 2, 2, replicate 2, replicate of 2, 3. That's because you want to replicate the value 3 twice, replicate 1, 4, plus plus, replicate 1, 5, etc. That will produce this list 1, 1, 1, plus plus 2, 2, plus plus 3, 3, etc. And this will finally produce this list, which is the sorted version of the original list. Accum array works in time proportional to the length of the association list and asox also works in time proportional to the length of the list produced. Therefore, this algorithm works in linear time or order n plus max minus min of the elements in the array if you prefer of the elements in the list. Finally, here is the code for linear time sorting with accum array. We start with the function count which takes a list of integers and produces a list of pairs of integers. This is the associative list of counts. Counts of x's is asox of accum array with plus 0 l comma u on the association list zip x's once. Once if you, as you recall is iterate id 1 which produces the infinite list consisting of 1 1 1 etc. l is the minimum in the original list u is the maximum in the original list. With these as indices, we produce this array of counts and extract the association list that is embedded in the array into the by using the function asox. Array sort takes y's which is counts of x's and for each entry i comma n in y's, it does replicate n i and finally concatenates this list using the function concat. So finally, you get a sorted version of the original list. In summary, recursive programs can sometimes be very inefficient, recomputing the same value again and again. This was illustrated in the fib function as well as in the LCSS function. Memoization is an important technique that renders this process efficient sometimes by storing values the first time they are computed and referring to the stored values rather than recomputing the in the subsequent times that they are needed. Haskell arrays provides an efficient implementation of these techniques and it is an important tool to keep in our arsenal.